ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Australian cartoonist and author Warren Brown will be going out for a drive soon and he may not be back for quite some time. Warren Brown will set out from London this year in a century-old car that was known in its time as a bean. And from London, he'll drive this car all the way to Australia, travelling across Europe, the Middle East, Southeast Asia and the Australian continent before he comfortably pulls into Melbourne in time for afternoon tea. And in doing so, Warren will be replicating the epic drive of a century ago, made by the pioneering Australian motorist Francis Bertels. Now, Warren has done something insanely similar to this before. Years ago, you might recall, he and some colleagues successfully replicated the Peking to Paris car rally of 1907. Well, now Warren wants to travel in the tyre tracks of his hero, Francis Bertels, in the same model car that Bertels rattled his way in from one end of the world to the other. Warren's written a hugely entertaining biography of Francis Bertels and how he perpetrated the greatest motoring feat of its time. During his nine-month journey through Europe and Turkey, Iran and India, Bertels motored through mountainous terrain in countries where they'd not even yet seen a car. And where there were no roads, Bertels hacked through the jungle to forge a path. And there were times when he and his assistant fought off tigers with an elephant gun. Hello, Warren. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Richard. It's lovely to be here. Tell me how you heard about Francis Bertels, please. Well, that's an interesting story, Richard. I'd never heard of him. And as you know, I'm a car guy. I used to be a Top Gear host, for crying out loud. But when the National Museum of Australia opened in Canberra in 2000, it was going to be Australia's Smithsonian Institute and all. There was a bit of, you know, a bit of controversy. And I thought, I'll go down and have a look at uh, the National Museum in Canberra. And I was wandering around in there in the corner of the museum was a bashed up vintage car sitting in the dark, sort of dramatically lit. And I thought, well, what on earth is this? And it looked like it had, you know, done, you know, 15 rounds with Mike Tyson. It was a poor old dilapidated thing. And it had a sign there and it said this bean car had broken a speed record from Darwin to Melbourne in 1926. And then on the side of the car was a brass plaque and it said, London to Melbourne, 1927-28. I thought, wait a minute, in newspaper terms, we call that burying the lead. The real story (laughs) is actually this car is driven from London to Melbourne. And I looked at it, it was a make I'd never heard of, a bean car, and it had been driven by somebody called Francis Bertels, and I'd never really heard of him either. And that kicked it off for me. I was was hooked from then on. When you look at a map of the world and you draw a line from where Bertels had driven from here to there, from there to here all over the world. What does it look like, Warren? Well, I mean, when he he did the drive from 1927 through to 1928, if you drew a line diagonally across from, you know, from England to Australia, a great portion of that was through the British Empire. So, you know, once you got out of Europe and you got in the Middle East, then it was, uh, you know, British mandated Iraq and then into India and then all down to the Singapore Peninsula, the Malay Peninsula. So what he was trying to do was actually trying to link up this kind of nebulous kind of idea that you could actually travel by road through the British Empire. Through the pink bits on the map. Through the pink bits on the map, indeed. (laughs) Yeah, so that's what he was kind of trying to do. So how did you procure your very own bean, like the one he had? Well, you mentioned before about the Peking to Paris raid that we we made in in 2005, and it was actually the ABC who approached me and said, oh, look, are there any other great historical motoring adventures but with a more Australian feel? And I thought, gee, the Francis Bertel story is the best of all. And so I, I looked around for, um, for a, a bean car. They're quite rare, and they were a fairly austere robust English car of the of the era. Um, they weren't... By, by that, do you mean not very good? Or... Yeah, well, it's interesting, Richard. Um, it's funny, I, I once had the, the opportunity to interview um, Geoffrey Smart, the famous painter, of yes. course, you know, and we got talking about uh, about cars. He was quite a car buff. He said, oh, I love French cars. He says, I have a Citroën back in Italy, you know, and I said, oh, I have a 1925 Bean. He says, a Bean? He says, my father had a Bean. Absolute shit of a car. <laughs> And that's from Jeffrey Smart. Yes, yeah, from Jeffrey Smart. So when I was researching the book, interestingly about Bean, the Bean Car Company, was that they, unusually for the time, had their eye set squarely on Australia. 
because at the time in the 1920s, Australians were buying American cars, not English cars, and they thought if we can get in there and take take on the Americans in Australia, we're going to do it. That's what they were thinking. And so how did you locate your own bean? Took a while. Uh, I have to say I looked all over the world for one and then lo and behold, through a contact, I discovered there was one in Canberra of all places, quite near to the National Museum of Australia, and a lovely chap, Alec McKernan, had this car. So this particular car that he had put together and restored had been a project Bertel's car, his his own bean, is in the National Museum of Australia in Canberra. It was going to be taken to the tip at Bungendore in the 1960s, the early 1960s, and these two guys saved it and they they put it back together and got it more or less running and they wanted to build a a road-going replica. So they bought another bean 14 and, and built the body, which is my car, and it was a project that was not finished until about 2004. So it had been, you know, boxes of parts for for decades had been passed from one collector to another and finally we got it and we've rebuilt it ready for the trip. And how does it feel to drive that car today? Oh, it's a handful. <laughs> handful, <laughs> Richard. It's great. I mean, you Slippery know, clutch. Slippery. Kind of oh, yeah. Well, yeah, crash gearbox, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Side, four-cylinder side valve motor. Um, no seat belts, no roof. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, but it is quite a handful of a car. But it's delight. You know, it's pure motoring. You know what you're doing. You've got the bugs in your teeth and you've got the goggles on and the flying helmet and the gauntlets. <laughs> And, you know, you love it. It's, it's tremendous. I'm excited even thinking about it. Francis Bertels was a man of enormous ingenuity and courage and all those things. Where did he grow up, Warren? Where's he from? He came from a poor working class background in Fitzroy in Melbourne with lots of brothers and sisters, but he, he just didn't, didn't sort of fit in anywhere. In fact, in his whole life, he never held a job really at all. He, he sort of went from one mad, hairy-chested adventure to another. <laughs> but when, <laughs> when he was young, he decided he wanted to travel. And, of course, I mean, it's very easy to travel now. You just buy an airline ticket for not very much money and you can go wherever you like. But in those days, and I'm talking, he was born in 1881, so I'm talking sort of the turn of the 19th, 20th century. The way to see the world was to join the Merchant Navy, which is what he did. And so his first experience was on, was on board ships that were – he had actually travelled around all sorts of places, around the world to Canada and the United States and Europe and all sorts of things when he was very young. And then when the Boer War broke out, he was on Merchant Navy ships – transferring Australian troops from Australia to South Africa, and that's when his life really kicked off. Yes, that's when he discovered the glory of this newfangled device called the bicycle, which was fairly new in those days, wasn't it? We're talking turn of the century here during the Boer War. Indeed, Richard. Well, I mean, there had been bicycles. There had been penny farthings, of course, and those dreadful things called bone shakers, which were was sort of <laughs> <laughs> predated that. But when he got to South Africa, he jumped ship from the Merchant Navy and tried to join the Australian forces there. Of course, there was no Australian army in those days. This is Federation. There was sort of the New South Wales mounted lancers and the Victorian mounted rifles and the Tasmanian on foot something or other, other 53rd <laughs> Regiment or whatever. So, oh, if you know, my father fought and died for the Tasmanian on foot something or others. <laughs> <laughs> Mentioned in dispatches, I know, <laughs> old Thaddeus Feidler. Um, so he wanted to join up and he couldn't do it for whatever reason. He couldn't join the Australian forces. So he joined a South African unit, which in those days, I mean, everybody was under the flag of the British Empire, so it didn't really matter whether you joined the Canadians, the Australians or whatever you were doing. And one of the things he noticed there was the prevalence of bicycles. And they were conventional-looking bicycles that we know now. They called a diamond frame bicycle. And so they were being used for very successful military operations. In fact, on both sides, the Boer Boer commander, and his name was Theron, Daniel Theron, and he was like a guerrilla commando guy and he had all these guys on bicycles and they'd ride around and shoot things up and blow things up. Theron? Yes, you're right. He is actually the great uncle of Charlize Theron, the actress. I knew where you were going with that. Yeah, he really is. He genuinely, genuinely is. And so these bicycle guerrillas were going out there because... The bicycle did everything the horse couldn't do. With a horse, with the cavalry, it requires great veterinary care and feed and horses couldn't climb over rocks and they get bogged and all sorts of, they get injured and all, but a bike... You could ride, other than getting a puncture or the chain coming off, you could lift the thing up and you could walk across marshes and carry them up the top of mountains and do all sorts of things. Very successful. So both sides of the forces in, in South Africa were using bicycles very successfully. So what did he do with this bike when he got back to Australia? Well, before he got back to Australia, he went on a, a very long bicycle ride into the great Karoo Desert in South Africa. And then he, when he got back to Australia, he was thinking of doing the same thing. 
and he was part of a group of overlanding cyclists, they were called. It was overlanding a, cyclists. Yes, it was a fad, Richard. Some, this is a fad that I don't think I'd ever be part of. <laughs> but these strapping young men who, who'd get bicycles and they'd ride out into the Never Never where a horse couldn't go and they would go and do these ama- have these amazing feats. So they were, there was a whole bunch of these guys and they'd be riding across Australia and around Australia and diagonally across Australia and all over the place on bicycles. Yeah. It's an astonishing thing. What, through the Great Sandy Desert or something? Uh, of course, yes, indeed. But you and have to push your bike through through that for well, a large part. Well, well, I it? guess that's why I call it a push bike. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but they would. Um, but they, the thing was, with the bicycle could propel you very, very quickly over incredible distances that a horse couldn't go. The only problem with that was it'd fling you out so far that if something went wrong, you'd have a devil of a time trying to get back. And quite often, some of these overlanding cyclists would perish out there. They'd die of thirst. And apparently, when you die of thirst, people tear their clothes off. So they'd find the bodies of these cyclists with all their clothing around them. They'd gone, kind of gone mad, dying of thirst. But it was a very dangerous thing, yeah. So how did Bertels then decide, like Toad of Toad Hall, to give away the bicycle and decide that... The motor car was the only thing, the only way to travel. Well, Bertels, he'd become quite a, a sensation, a faint, like a celebrity in his day. So he'd made this big ride from Fremantle to Sydney, which everybody thought he was mad, and he'd made it. And then he was, he'd gone from zero to hero when he got to Sydney. And then he was doing other big rides around the place. So we went for this amazing ride that went up to the Gulf of Carpentaria and up to Darwin. And then he was cutting down from right through the middle of Australia on a bicycle and he happened to encounter a car coming the other way. Can you believe it? It was 1908, and it was these two South Australian fellas, uh, Harry Dutton and Murray Orange, and they decided to try and make the first transcontinental crossing of Australia by car in a car called a Talbot, a very fine English car. And transcontinental, we would think of it as running east to west, but in those days it was south to north because they were following the overland telegraph line and it pointed to Europe, back to the mother country. So you actually were thinking south to north because the Australians were thinking of the well, old country. Some desperate pilgrimage back to the mother country. It, well, right. it was kind by of. By bicycle. Is, yes, in a sort of psychological <laughs> sense. But these guys, you can imagine they're, they're sort of, you know, terrified, puttering along through the desert and they see something in the distance going, what on earth is that? And they're looking through the field glasses, the binoculars going, it's a guy on a bicycle out in the desert. And so here's this incredible meeting of these guys, you know, two fellows in this car that's set up like a covered wagon with, you know, rifles and axes and all sorts of things of this incredible odyssey that they're on. And here comes this skinny little guy with a, with a broad-brimmed hat and shorts on, on a bike. That's Francis Bertels. And where have you come from? Darwin. Darwin, that's like, that's a thousand miles away. Oh, where were you before that? Oh, well, I started in Martin Place in Sydney. What? You know? And so they get this amazing (laughs) story with this guy. But Bertels there and then, he sees this car, this Talbot, and, the you know, the cogs are ticking. As You can hear them, these cogs are turning, you know, in his mind that, that this is the future for exploration. You see, I think we need to sort of shift our thinking on this, and I know you've already done this, but I think... These seem like people capering about in these antiques at the moment. But for them, what they're doing is experiencing the cutting edge of technology. This is the area when they, the era when you have radio, yeah. when you have the motor car, you have uh, the first planes. And so suddenly, let's see what the technology can do. Well, that's exactly right, Richard. And, and of course, for those fellows, Dutton and Orange, it was a particularly grim trip. They'd tried it once before and they'd had fuel dumped out there because, you know, you, petrol dumped by cameleers, these Afghan cameleers, in fuel dumps along the way. Way, and then these sort of flimsy tin cans. Well, the heat was so intense it exploded all the fuel before they got there. Oh, so the first expedition conked out. They were doing their second and very nervous, but run into this guy. But you're quite right, Richard. Like Francis Bertels, having come from the Boer War, which was a particularly brutal war that used things like machine guns yes. and pinpoint accurate artillery, which was heading on towards the First World War. So technology was advancing all the time. So this led him to take his first. Australian continental drive. Tell me about this trip and the man he took with him, Warren. Well, it's actually the other way around, Richard. He was some, it was a chap called Sid Ferguson, who was a mechanic from Kensington in Sydney. And he had been approached by a a company called the Brush, the Canadian Cycle and Car Company, but a car called a Brush. And the motto was, Brush sweeps all before it. (laughs) But it was a single cylinder car. So it had one piston. What? Yeah. So it had one piston that went bang, 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 bang. And so the idea was they were going to drive this car latitudinally across Australia. The first time a car had ever been driven latitudinally across Australia. Sid Ferguson, he was a great mechanic and a driver, and they needed someone with a bit of, you know, 
bit of presence and a bit of panache. So they go, let's get that cyclist guy, Francis Bertels. He'll travel with Sid Ferguson. We'll ship the car around to Fremantle and drive off across Australia and I'll come back in, into Sydney and the first time a car has been driven across the continent and it'll be a brush. So they do all this and they send the car around to... <laughs> they send the car around by ship because that's how you travelled around Australia. You didn't do it overland, you did it by ship. You ran all the way from Sydney around to Fremantle and then the car's unloaded, tiny little car, and then it's uploaded with all this equipment and tonnes of things and guns and rifles and bedrolls and they, they get a little dog, they've got a little dog travelling with them. So Sid Ferguson and Francis Bertels get in this tiny little car with one cylinder and one piston going bang, 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 <laughs> and they head off, they're heading east. Well, it turns rather sour. Rather, really? Rather things went wrong? Hard to imagine. <laughs> What could go wrong? <laughs> what went wrong? Well, what happened was Bertels was sort of famous and Sid Ferguson, he, it, Bertels knew nothing about cars, didn't know how to drive one, didn't know how to fix one. Everybody understood the bicycle because it was just pedals, you pedal and it turns a, a gear and then the gear turns a chain and the chain turns a, turns a wheel. But a car was something completely different and what went on under the, under the bonnet was a complete mystery. And, but Sid Ferguson knew all about it and knew how to do it. So they're heading off and, of course, they're travelling through properties that are the size, the size of Bell. Belgium, you know, and they've got gates everywhere. So every time they get to a gate, Bertels has to get out, open the gate, and Ferguson drives through. And he doesn't like gate. that. Doesn't like doesn't that. Like There's that. a sort of master servant thing right. going doesn't on. Doesn't want here. to be Mr. <coughs> second banana. Right. But on top of that, Richard, Bertels is not particularly convinced about motor cars at all. So he's brought his bike with him and he's brought it like a lifeboat and he's lashed it to the back of the car. So Ferguson thinks, bloody hell, one night he's just going to, you know, if something goes wrong, he's just going to pedal off and leave me here to die. So. Ferguson, he takes the, secretly takes the cotter pin out of where the pedals are and takes the pedals <laughs> off the bike, so hides the pedals so that Bertels can't escape. <laughs> so he dismantles the life raft. Yeah, yeah. Right. But, but they have wow. all sorts of crazy adventures mm. and they get stuck in, you know, salt pans and they try to, they wrap rope around the, the axles to try and use it as a winch and it pulls all the telegraph poles over because they're all white-handed and all sorts of things. And eventually, of course, they eventually do make it all the way across from Fremantle to Sydney. And what happens when they arrive in Sydney? Well, word gets out, of course. They get to the Blue Mountains. These two guys have actually made it, you know, by Morse, Morse Key. They find, you know, Sydney finds out that Bertels and Ferguson are, are there. And anyway, so all these motorists come out to greet them and they drive them into, into Martin Place and hats, boater hats are thrown in the air and there's brass bands and everybody's cheering. The next day they were going to be front page news, but that night this big ship in the North Atlantic hits an iceberg and the Titanic happens right April 1912. Oh, no! And so they miss out on the proper response that they were due. It miss, miss, they lost out to the Titanic. The, the whole thing that they were working yeah. towards as far as the Brush Car Company yes. is concerned, the front page splash that they're supposed to get, yeah. they're just relegated to page five because of the Titanic, essentially. That, that's right. <laughs> and, and by the way, these two chaps just drove across Australia. <laughs> Quite oh, amazing. Dear. So then he, he decided to make a movie, and again, this is another technology that's yes. just emerging, to follow the trail of Burke and Wills by a motor car. How did that go, Warren? Uh, well, it, it was an amazing kind of odyssey. It, it, it was quite inventive. So he was not afraid of technology at all. I mean, he started to get the idea of the motor car and using cine cameras and good photographic equipment. So what he was trying to do was go out into the wilds and tell a story and come back and then he would have these sort of ma magic lantern slideshows and silent movie things and he would talk talk to the audience about his experiences out into the wild. So I heard him described as being the original Leyland brother. He would go out <laughs> into, and, and then you know, regale audiences with his tales of daring do and, you know, and how I shot an alligator because they were called – they used to call crocodiles alligators in those days. Mm. But he went out to try and solve the mystery of what happened to Burke and Wills. And so he went up to Cooper's Creek and all these places up there and where Burke and Wills were and he managed to find, believe it or not, elderly Aborigines who had found – King, King was the last, was the, the sole survivor of that, of the Burke and Wills expedition. And I remember as a boy, my grandmother, who was you know, quite elderly, she was born in 1895, they used to talk about King. He, oh, he went mad and he lived with the Aborigines. Actually, he, he, he went mad and he was the only one that lived. So <laughs> rather than sort of dying a sort of vainglorious death, he knew what he was doing. So Bertels actually filmed these people who had actually met King. It seems he had quite enlightened views about Aboriginal people by the standards of the day and so far as he treated them like human beings by the sound of oh, the Oh, very days. much so. Well, Richard, it's, it, when he was young, he had sort of tipping 
typical views that you know, Australian Europeans had of Aborigines. And but in time, the more he travelled out into Australia's dead heart, into all these sort of remote places, he developed an affinity with them and they loved him too. So they used to call him motor car Frank and they could hear his Model T Ford coming along and they, you know, they'd really fate him and he was invited to go to lots of very special religious ceremonies and things. And in fact, his photographs are so good and atypical for the time, he would photograph Indigenous Australians not as sort of some tricked up thing, but in their natural world. So if you see photographs of Indigenous Australians in the teens and 1920s, very likely they're Francis Bertels photographs. And there's a big collection held at IATSIS in Canberra called the Francis Bertels Collection. So then we get to the 1920s. And at this point, a character enters the picture, a Sydney journalist by the name of <laughs> Malcolm Ellis. Tell me about this man, Malcolm Ellis, who was to partner up with Francis Bertels. Well, Malcolm Ellis was a, I think you would call him like editor at large. He was an opinion writer for the Sydney Daily Telegraph. And did he have opinions, Warren? Oh, he had opinions. In fact, Manning Clark described him as one of nature's fascists. <laughs> <laughs> he was off the Richter scale when it became to sort of right-wing viewing. But he was fascinated with politics. In fact, during the First World War, Malcolm Ellis had, in fact, been a spy. He worked for the Commonwealth... Directorate of Propaganda, which was, if you sort of join the dots, a sort of, you know, precursor to ASIO and ASIS and these sorts of things, more or less. It was a, a federal thing. And he there had been big riots in Brisbane uh, called the Red Flag Riots in 1917. It was just after the, the Russian Revolution and there was a very, it was quite a big Russian community in Brisbane at the time and there was great fear that Bolshevism was coming to Australia and Malcolm Ellis was, you know, he was fascinated by all this sort of stuff and he regularly editorialised on on the wickedness of Bolshevism and unions, the, right? How, how evil they were. The Bolshevik threat to Brisbane. So how did he come into the picture, Warren? What did he have to offer in this matter? So in 1924, the Royal Navy's brought seven warships to, to Australia. They're on a sort of global publicity cruise. It was called the Special Service Squadron and one of the ships that came to Sydney was HMS Hood. Of course, that was later sunk by the Bismarck, but at the time, in the 1920s, it was the most advanced weapon the world had ever seen. It arrived in in Sydney and there were 4,500 British sailors who just swamped Sydney. And so the Royal Automobile Club in Sydney came up with this very ingenious idea of a motor pool that all these volunteered motorists would act as chauffeurs and, and drive these sailors all around in Sydney wherever they wanted to go, a volunteer thing. And the Royal Navy brought with it this bean car. So uh, this Malcolm Ellis happened to be walking along Macquarie Street and saw this bean, bean car and it just captured his imagination and he, he wrote about it. Now, there it was parked alongside the Admiral's Rolls-Royce, you know, and this this fine symbol of British, you know, of Albion and the British Lion and the Union Jack and all that sort of stuff, made of the finest steel and Dudley in the Midlands and all this sort of thing. Then he had this idea, I wonder if the bean car company loans this car to the Daily Telegraph, then I'll get Francis Bertels and he and I will drive up to Darwin on an all-British expedition. So every single thing that was in the car, a knife and fork and spoon and plate and towel, and would be made somewhere in Britain. And was this to assert the British Empire over the Americans, was it? It, it was indeed. It was to prove that a British car could, could outdo an American car. The reason that, that Australians bought American cars was that in Britain, you know, the, the Britain the British weren't interested in supplying cars to Australia very much because, you know, Britain is a tiny little country with villages very close together on beautiful roads. Australia is an enormous country the size of continental Europe with immense distances on terrible roads and the United States was more like that. So oh. they were buying cars that were way more suited to... For built American conditions, indeed, indeed, which suited our conditions. Indeed, but this bean looked like hey, this is kind of American in thinking. And indeed, the Bean Car Company was looking at Australia as a possible target. Bertels and Ellis went and did this amazing drive up to Darwin and back, and it was hugely successful. And then the Bean Car Company was so impressed by the publicity that they brought this two-seater car out, this little, it's like a sports car, Bean 14, and then they gave it to Bertels to drive from Darwin to Melbourne to break a speed record because now it was all about speed, not so much exploration. It was about shaving time off, about getting quicker and quicker and quicker. And, and Ellis by now was the Daily Telegraph's London correspondent. And he was talking to a Sydney industrialist in London and he came up with the idea why don't we, thinking in the back of his mind, I mean, this is all political, you see, why don't we get a car and see if we can prove that we can drive from England to Australia? 
We'll drive all the way to Singapore and then ship it to Darwin and then drive from Darwin to Melbourne. And they think this is a great idea. So eventually Ellis gets Bertels involved in this and Bertels comes to London and they they implore the Bean Car Company to build them a special car, a car unique for Australians, and a six-cylinder car with three-speed gears because you don't want lots and lots and lots of gears. You only want three-speed gears. And so the Bean Car Company says, okay, well, we'll build you a one-off, a prototype. So... Within no time, they eventually build this prototype car and with only 50 miles on the clock, off they go. They set off. So Ellis and uh, Bertels and another chap, Billy Knowles, who was a sort of war veteran, they set off from Leicester Square on their way to Australia. How were they located in the car? Oh, well, so they had this one-off car, this prototype car called the Bean Imperial 6, and it was a great, a worker at the time described the car as a as a ghastly looking car, like a truck. He said it looked. It was a great big car, big six cylinder thing, and they sat three abreast in this car, all rugged up. And of course, the bean, three abreast, three abreast in this car, jammed in the car, and it was an unusual looking car, big thing, very big thing. And at the time, it was described as being the size of a Rolls Royce, so it was quite a big car. So they set off from Leicester Square, and of course, they only go about 10, 10 yards, and they crash into something, which is. <laughs> Like, bang. It's like, this is not going to be very good. So so they set off across the world, yeah. Podcast and broadcast. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. You can find more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. And what was their planned route? The plan was that they would cross Europe and then into Turkey and then go down through Syria into the Middle East and then end up in India and then go up through Burma into the Naga Hills and then down to the Malay Peninsula to Singapore and then ship the car to Darwin, drive all the way to Melbourne, home and hose. That was the plan. Piece of cake. Yeah. Okay. So they crossed the channel on on some sort of ship, a, 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 a steamer of some kind, and they set out, but they're heading into a, a Europe that's getting colder and colder all the time. What were the conditions like well, on the road? It was apparently the worst winter that um, that Europe had had in 40 years. And one of the problems was the Ben Car Company were, were not particularly enthused about building this car. So it had been delayed and delayed and delayed. And when they set off, it was, a, it was the middle of a European winter. So they get to Germany and like to fire the car up in the morning, they'd have to light a fire under the car to try and thaw the oil out. <laughs> and, and Ellis writes about this, you know, this recipe for firing up to, you know, to, to do this kind of thing. And, of course, the only person who could really drive the car was Bertels and the only person who could actually fix the car was Bertels. So it became a fairly, you know, three fellows who were, you know, things became tense, Richard. A bit tense. Now, they're driving through Germany of 1927 and just getting the history in my head. Yeah. This is uh, the Nazi Party is very much it's, it's on the rise. Yes. Yeah. Maybe it's about to dip again before the Great Depression, but nonetheless there's been the Beer Hall putsch and the Nazi Party are having parades. They're doing all kinds of things like that, but they're not in power yet. How impressed was Malcolm Ellis well, by the Nazis? Well, to be honest, Richard, the whole premise for this trip was actually a political fact-finding mission. That's what it was. And so Malcolm Ellis had it in his mind that he was going to first-hand going to check out what was going on in, in Europe, particularly in Germany. He was fascinated. This was cover for a spy mission? Yes, so um, in his own way, it was not a kind of uh, uh, like a, a, an official government-sponsored thing. This is a Malcolm Ellis, oh, I'm I going see. to do it on my own. But, but you, know, you know, in the Middle Ages, you'd see traders and travellers going along the old silk roads yes. and they would, they would be spies as well. They'd oh. report back to the caliph or the, the emperor or, what, or the king or whatever. Well, but Malcolm yeah. Ellis, in the, in the lead-up to, you know, before the expedition left, he had access to these incredible military, like maps and things that no one else had. And as he wrote, you know, military men, close-cropped military men would come and come and go. And he was introduced to Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence, for advice. He was taken to meet him. And Lawrence gave him all sorts of advice of driving in the desert. And the intelligence he had was second to none. So what he was wanting to do is check these things out. He just couldn't help himself. So wherever they'd go, they'd end up getting arrested because Ellis would hang around the front gates of some, you know, some military establishment. And then the, the, the guards <laughs> would come and, and he'd, he'd bluff his way up by saying, I'm, I'm a British diplomat. Diplomat. But, you know, he had a, a, a pistol in his pocket, brass knuckles and a knife and all sorts. So it was kind of this bumbling spy who was getting them into trouble all the time. 
they get through Germany and they enter into the Balkans. They go through, you write very entertainingly about this, about them going through the Dragoman Pass and suddenly they're in Dracula country. Yes. And they had been warned, you write, by the Serbs, yes. <laughs> by the Serbs that when they got to Bulgaria, the Bulgarians <laughs> on the other side routinely drank blood with their porridge. Yes. What, were, what was the truth of this? Though? How did they get on with the Bulgarians? Well, they got on famously because the Bulgarians hated the Bolsheviks. And <laughs> right. so they would regularly hunt um, communists and, and Ellis thought this was marvellous. He, was, you know, he saw sort of, you know, bullet holes in trees. Oh, that's where we got one of these communists. They, you know, the Bulgarians would say. And Ellis went, these are my people. These are my right, people. Right, yeah, right. yeah, that's right. So then they get through... Uh, into Turkey to Istanbul and ha- tell me how they ran afoul of the authorities. Well, as typically, uh, uh, for some reason, like if you have a look at the map, um, Ellis insisted they go to the naval base at Izmir in Turkey, which is not really on the way, but they get there and, of course, they get arrested for hanging around near the naval base <laughs> and they're put into the Hotel Izmir as prisoners. This kind of under house arrest. And what had happened was that only some months before, six months before, there'd been an assassination attempt on Mustafa Kemal Ataturk Right there, in front of the, the the hotel there, and these would be assassins were going to put hand grenades in bunches of flowers and throw them into Ataturk's open car. But one of them, you know, gave up everybody before it all happened, and all these fellows that were the conspirators were hanged in front of the hotel where Bertels and Ellis and Knowles were imprisoned at the hotel Izmir. So they were kept there for some weeks. Managed to, they had an interpreter. Managed to invent this story that the interpreter's wife was sick back in Istanbul, and he got a message out, and the. the the British Consul General from Ankara came down and got them out. Wasn't happy about doing that. No, and I wouldn't be happy if I was Bertels at this point, just quietly. I would I would be thinking, this idiot's going to get us killed, well, Malcolm Ellis. Yes. Well, Ellis wrote that Bertels, you know, actually for a moment considered trying to escape and Ellis said, we knew that if he tried that, it would be bad for all of us, you know. So then they get into Syria, and this is when Knowles, the, the third man, bails out. Yes, he's too much for Knowles. It's, the car is, this prototype car has been nothing but trouble from start to finish. It broke down in every, it, it, it seemed virtually every mechanics workshop from London to, you know, Damascus so far. And he just eventually just gave up and they put him on a train and sent him back home. So then it was just Ellis and Bertels. So then there's hard motoring across the hard Iranian oh, yeah. plateau, which can get very bleak in places. Yes. And must have reminded them of the outback. But tell me about the man they found lying in the deserts of the Iranian plateau. The most difficult places they were told that they were going to going to face were the Dragoman Pass. We, we just mentioned that before. The Lut Desert in Persia, which is an abiotic desert. Nothing lives in there. And they stumble upon this guy who's delirious from nearly dead, you know, parched with thirst, and they put him in the car and they save him. You know, it's quite incredible. And they get they get all the way through uh, Balochistan, which is an amazing thing in, in its own right, but they save it's just the, the, the incredible amount of coincidental things that they find along the way. And they make it eventually all the way into India. Yes. Now, this is, this is already a very epic trip, but they've made it to India and then... It comes to a premature end. It does. It Why? Does. Well, Ellis is very ill by then and he's suffering from all, he's covered in sores and he's having hallucinations and the car keeps breaking down, this prototype bean car. And Bertels is, has just about had enough with this car. And in the end, you know, Ellis is just paralysed and he's in this remote hospital way out in the middle of nowhere in India somewhere or other and the car finally dies and Bertels gets the tile lever and just starts smashing the car to bits and that's the end of that particular expedition. Ellis gets sent home to Cremorne where he lives in Sydney and Bertels decides he's going to do something about it. Yeah. So... The story doesn't end here, though, no. Warren. It doesn't end here at all. No. What does Bertels do now that he's freed himself from the clutches of the spy Malcolm Ellis? <laughs> so what he does, he takes the spies, maps all of them, and when Ellis goes back to Australia, Bertels hops on a steamer back to England where his car, the car that he did the, the speed record, uh, the Sundowner, it was, as it was called, the Bean 14, the two-seater, is in London, has come back from Australia, it's doing a publicity tour. So he goes and says to the Bean car company, I'm going to have a go at this again, give me that car, and I'm going to go and try and do it again. And so, what does the Bean company think about that? 
Well, they're not quite sure. They don't want to give him any money, but they said, look, okay, well, you can work on the car in our workshops, um, give it a go, off you go. So he gets a little bit of sponsorship from a petrol company and an oil company, and that's about it. And so, he's doing it all over again. Solo. He's going to start yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Solo from London. Absolutely. So he, you know, they, so from Australia House on the Strand, there's a big farewell, you know, for Bertolt and all these people throwing their hats in the air and Miss Australia 1927 is there, Phyllis von Alwyn, and she gives him a peck on the cheap. And there's actually cinema footage of this, of, of, of the departure. And he's there with the car once again. And by this stage, he's every time he had a car, he'd paint things on it. So he's painted kookaburras and hands and all sorts of things. And it's quite a distinctive looking car. And he sets off to do this 26,000 kilometre drive solo. So he's charging off again. He gets across the channel, charges through France, Austria, Yugoslavia and again into Bulgaria and down to Greece with roads getting worse at every step of the way. When we think of roads, what are we, what are we talking about here? What kind of roads would exist? Well, they, they would be roads for sort of tumbrel carts and things like that, like donkey-drawn donkey, donkey drawn vehicles and things like that. So, And interestingly, you mentioned about him going to Greece and the reason he didn't follow the original route was because the Turks wouldn't let him back into Turkey. So he decided instead of trying to drive overland that way, he'd drive to Greece put the car on a ship to Alexandria and then cut out the whole section of Turkey and and go that way. So he's got to cross the Suez Canal then? That's right, he crosses that. the Suez and then he crosses the Sinai, which, you know, he comments, you know, he feels you know more at home in the open deserts than the, than the cities. It's more like Australia. Oh, he's very familiar with this. Oh, he's cycled across it, driven of across course, it. Of course, of course. And the, the thing about the Sinai is it's a tiny little, it's actually a tiny little desert. It's only about this, you know, the, the distance from like Sydney to Newcastle or something in New South Wales. It's not like the, the great city. Simpson Desert or Australian Desert. So he's right at home doing this. So this working class Roy boy is going to all these fabulous places. He's he's in Mesopotamia. He goes through Baghdad and then on into Persia once again and he drove through a blizzard into Afghanistan. Now, this is when you write that he drove up to what he thought was a rock. Yes. It turned out to be a car. Indeed. So he's in this snowstorm and he gets on top of this mountain range in Iran and Persia and and he's, the weather's just getting worse and worse and worse. And he has this open car, the open two-seater car, which has this makeshift canvas roof, which is, really does nothing. And he's there in the storm and he's huddled, he's trying to, trying to pitch the, get, make a kind of shelter, a tent top thing while this snowstorm's going on. And he's dragging this, he's leaning up against something he thinks is a rock, but it's a car. And it's it's stopped and it's covered in snow and all the the people inside of, are, are dead. They're frozen solid. There's a whole family inside the car. How ghastly! Yes, and he has to camp there overnight. And he just he just to his shock, he just finds these people inside the car. Most the most hideous thing to find, most unexpected thing. And meanwhile, what was the word about him in Australia at the time? Well, he kept disappearing as he always did. You know, Bertels would do this back in Australia. He'd disappear into the, into the never never, and then he'd resurface again. So. Australians were getting used to his, you know, transglobal drive. He'd disappear for some time. And, of course, this he became quite ill during this time. He sort of ended up in a kind of Foreign Legion-style fort where he could sort of recuperate for a while. But then he was heading on to his greatest challenges, and that was India and Burma, of course. Indeed. So he goes from there across northwest India and yes. into Calcutta, Kolkata, where he picked up a Canadian co-driver, a, a Canadian named... Percy Stollery. Yes. Now, in your book, at this point, you've, you've recorded that he received a telegram. A telegram had been sent by the Autom- Automobile Association of Rangoon. Yes. Wouldn't you love to be a member of the Automobile Association of Rangoon, <laughs> just, just, just quietly? I'm working on it, Richard. You're working on it, working on it. And, and they're warning him about the challenge that's facing him when he goes into Burma. Indeed. And so, I mean, the thing is, what he's doing is he's going to head into a place called the Naga Hills, which would then tip him sort of then south into, into Burma and he ended up at Rangoon. But there were no roads in there and there'd never been a motor car in there ever. And so he re- like, receives this this telegram and it says, we notice that Mr Bertels proposes to do Calcutta Rangoon section by road. Does he know there is no road? Information received tells this is an impossible feat even for a well-prepared party, let alone a man alone. Even in fine weather, the jungle is impenetrable by car and the danger from wild animals and head-hunting natives is extreme. He should reconsider. Wow. (laughs) So... This is the bit we haven't talked about yet. He's got to go through the Naga yes. Hills. These are 60 mountains he's got to cross. Yes. 60 mountains yes. without a road. 
So what was his plan? He was just going to muddle through? Or? So what happened was that the the Royal Automobile Club in uh, Calcutta, or Kolkata, gave him an elephant gun, like a big ball gun in case he encountered tigers or whatever on the way. So he had a rough plan, and that was to try and follow animal tracks through the mountains. And he and That was it? Yeah. That's that how it. you're going to get a car through across 60 mountains? Was, yes. So there are amazing photographs of Bertels and Stollery hacking them because he was a great photographer. And so they would haul, build what they call a Spanish windlass and it was a kind of way of like a primitive kind of winch and they'd haul the car up and down mountains, up and down and up and down. And one night they had the car lashed to the side of a mountain. You know, it was about to plummet over the edge of a of a cliff and these tribesmen came through herding cattle and they just saw the ropes. I'm just going to get their big knives and cut the ropes and let the, <laughs> let the car. So Bertels just got the elephant gun out and pointed at this bloke and they got the picture and they went, rightio, we'll go around it then. We won't cut the ropes. But they encountered a tiger and all of a sudden Bertels shot a tiger and brought actually brought the head and skin back to Australia. But they disappeared and, and no one knew what happened to them. And in Australia, people became very worried. So what happened when he appeared, arrived victoriously in Rangoon? Well, it was a shock. Australians couldn't believe it. There was, you know, a search party that was being put together to try and go and find him. And then miraculously, of course, Bertels and Stollery reappear and emaciated. They All their clothes had rotted off and they were skin and bone and Bertels had a cut on his hand that had turned septic and they recuperated in Rangoon for some time. But it, what a monumental thing to do. There had been other expeditions thinking about doing this at the same time, but they just figured you couldn't do it, but Bertels did it. So he had done the impossible. He yeah. had done the impossible. Yes, it would be hard enough to go through these places on foot and he'd hauled a car through <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Good God. So then on to Penang, down to Singapore, then on a boat that arrives in Darwin at last. And, of course, being Australians, uh, uh, we, we gave them a, a fantastic welcome, didn't we? Yeah, well, the customs officer said, you can't bring that in, you've got to pay duty on it, which, of course, Bertels, <laughs> because he was famous for swearing. He would swear like nobody's business, like, you know, only 10% of a sentence was message, 90% of it was swear words. So he went bananas. You know, he said, I took this car from Australia. No, 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 you can't bring that. No, no, no. So he eventually he gets on the phone. He's, sorry, the... He's, sorry, I just want to point out here, he's crossed the Naga Hills. Yes, yes. He's survived yeah. like villages, tigers uh, and, and no. weeping septic sores but he's being held up by a customs officer you, you at Darwin. Can, you, there's no way you can beat an Australian with a hat and a whistle. <laughs> um, he, and so he just explodes. So he gets on the phone and he rings the Prime Minister, Stanley Melbourne Bruce, rings him up and Bruce is going, oh, we've had enough of Bertels. And he just says to the customs, he says, he says three words, release the car. <laughs> so, so he gets going. But, but of course, what had happened, Richard, when he'd left London, Bert Hinkler, the famous aviator, had seen him off and, uh, and they'd had a bet who would reach Australia first. Bert Hinkler was wanting to fly to Australia, but he had no sponsorship and he needed a plane. And Bertel's, you know, taken him nine months to get to Australia. In the meantime, Hinkler had found sponsorship, had arrived in Australia in no time flat and was fated as this um, unbelievable hero, you know, had given this huge monetary prize and, you know, presented to the, the new Parliament House in Canberra. And was, you know, But Bertel's is stuck on a, on a wharf in Darwin. Oh, dear. So by the time he gets to Melbourne, and he's been has he been overshadowed by Bert Hinkler's achievement? Oh, absolutely. Well, Bert Hinkler was just the thing. And and mind you, ten thousand people did come out to see Bertels arrive. But of course, the same thing happens. He gets to the Melbourne GPO, which is the geographical centre of Melbourne, where you'd measure it. He pulls up there and a policeman says, You can't stop here, mate, you're obstructing traffic. <laughs> and he had to move. There's no photograph of him arriving at the GPO because he had to move. The cops moved him on. <laughs> Oh, Australia. How about that? <laughs> there's, there's something terrible in this that he's... Um, I mean, I suppose he's there to showcase this exciting new technology, but then a more exciting technology Well, that's what happened, Richard. I mean, he was mm. eclipsed by the aviator. You know, the, and these fellows had come from a different war, not the Boer War. They'd come from the First Boer War, and they were the knights of the air. You know, there was something wonderful and exotic and science fiction-esque about aviators. And Bert Hinkler, you know, he was... Everyone remembers Bert Hinkler and Charles Kingford Smith, but... No one remembers Francis Bertels. So what was the rest of his life like after he'd done this monumental uh, challenge? Well, he... So in the final years of his life, I mean, people read that he he struck gold and he became a wealthy man and, and, and you know, he lived the rest of his life, you know, with, but with flash cars and buying photographic equipment. Well, he did become rich and he sort of struck gold, but what, in fact, he'd done was he'd got in with a bunch of these ne'er-do-wells and they'd set up a mining scam 
and in the Northern Territory. Bertels wrote, you know, he said, oh, I was out of my camp and, you know, a, a plane flew overhead and it dropped a note and it fluttered down and I was there with the dreaded berry berry, seriously, uh, the, the dreaded berry berry and, oh, the note said that my mining shares had come good and I was now a wealthy man, I'd want for nothing. Want for... But in fact... He'd done a Swifty. He and these other fellows, these ne'er-do-wells, had set up this scam. And it was a big story in the Northern Territory there. Francis Bertels had conned all these people and and they made a lot of money out of it. And so Bertels, he married in the end, and he married this woman, Nia, Nia McCutcheon was her name, and they bought a house in Coogee and, and so he lived the rest of it. He passed away in 1941, but it's it's a bit sad because people had forgotten about him already by the the end of his life, and there was a musical, a musical comedy film being made called That Certain Something in about 1940, and they needed someone to sort of have a walk on part as a an old time bushman, and someone said, "Ah, oh, remember there was that used to be that guy Francis Bertels. What happened to him? Let's get him in the film." So he begrudgingly has a walk on part in this musical comedy as an old bushman, and he says a few words. To my knowledge, it's the only recording of his voice, and that's you know that's it. And he's interviewed. You know, what do you think about being in a film? He says, "Ah, oh, it's just hot under those lights." And then he, he eventually he passes away in 1941, and he's buried in Waverley Cemetery. There was no big ceremony for for him or anything like that. He was largely forgotten by the end of his life. So this year, you're planning to reenact this trip. Yes, from <laughs> London to Melbourne. You're going to drive all the way to Melbourne. Indeed, in a car, the same kind of bean car yes, that Bertels did it in. A 1925 Bean 14, identical to Bertels' car. So, so Warren. Those pink bits on the map aren't there anymore. They're, they're different colours now. So you can't go through Syria. You, Iran, I'm assuming, is, is out. Iraq is probably almost certainly out. So would be Afghanistan. Have you got any mates in the Taliban or something, Warren? I mean, <laughs> what's, I'm working on it, what, what are you working on it? What, how, how are you going to do this? So it's interesting. There's been some, there are various routes that well, we're a great team. We're a team of four um, and it's great. My co-driver is Matthew Benz, who's a, a journalist at the Daily Telegraph with me, our, our mechanic, Tony Jordan, great rally driver as well, and Stuart Duncan, who's a, our videographer and cameraman as well. Um, and we, we, with the help of some of our sponsors and uh, some very diligent people, we've We've worked out various routes that we can take and you have to stay tuned, Richard, because it, it will depend also geopolitically as to where it will go, but you can do it and I'm very, very excited about doing it. Central Asia, that'd be it, wouldn't it? Russia, you Russia, can do that. So Russia's it, hard. Well, though. Russia's hard, but but, in, but that's the thing. So this drive from London to Melbourne, it's, it's been done, well, England to Australia, has been done many times since Bertels did this, of course. It was done by a Land Rover expedition in the mid-1950s and as recently as 2019, there was a recreation of that Land Rover expedition and they went over the top, so they went through the Stans. They went through Uzbekistan and various stands and then came down through that way. Um, so that's an option as well, but probably not at the moment with the way things are with, uh, you know, what's happening in the Ukraine. But but we've got some very, very good options that we can take. I wouldn't but, be surprised. I mean, this journey is going to take you through the ancient medieval and medieval silk roads, I would think. Partially, yes. So it will be, like I was saying, I mean, the, the journey has been done by many people over the years. You, you, you read about people who've done it in mini moke on a motorbike and they even they used to run double decker buses in the 1960s on the hippie trail that used to go up through there but i don't I'm, the thing for me is i want to tell the story i don't just want to do the trip so i'm not rusted on about having to follow exactly in Bertel's footsteps. Well, it's we, not possible anyway, and no, that's not the point. No, no, that's right. So I want to be able to tell the story because I think it's a, such a fascinating story and it's a good rip-roaring adventure that, you know, to craft it. And and some lovely things have happened in the time that I've been making it. I was lucky enough to interview Bertel's niece, 90-year-old uh, Muriel Tate. Some years ago, she's passed away now, and she gave me, I have this Burmese tiger, a brass tiger that her uncle gave to her on his way back from that mission. And we're putting the brass tiger on our car and going to drive all the way from London to Melbourne with this, with this tiger. I wish for nothing but good things for you on this trip. But part of me wants to hear that you've lugged a vintage car over the Naga Mountains <laughs> and come back as this kind of incredible muscle-bound, <laughs> leather, leathery skinned hard guy who's, like, taken up smoking and, and everything else. Will you be doing it in the original gear that he wore? Oh, absolutely, Richard. That's the other part of it. So we'll be living the world of the 1920s. So I'll be... 
wearing the flying helmet and goggles. And Matthew bought himself, Matthew, my co-driver, has bought himself a wonderful um, you know, Savile Row three-piece tweed suit. <laughs> Which so, and so we'll be, it'll be the whole thing. I've got curly moustache and we'll be doing living the world of the 1920s. And, of course, you can live by the great maxim of that time, which is that the English language can be understood anywhere in the world so long as it is spoken loudly and clearly. <laughs> My very word, Richard. <laughs> My very word. What a marvellous thing, Warren. I can't wait to hear of your adventures when you get back. Will you return to this program and tell us of your adventures? I would love to, Richard. It would be a great honour and I will have a very extra curly moustache and I'll be, I will be more ripped and, you know, muscly, muscle-bound and all that kind of thing. Yes, you'll be able to knock out a tiger with a single punch, <laughs> a single blow of your, of your powerful fist. Warren, thank you so much for sharing the story of Francis Bertels with us today. Thank you, Richard. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. 